Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sophie Alcorn. I'm the founder of Alcorn Immigration Law. I write for TechCrunch and I'm the host of the Sophie Alcorn podcast. My hobbies, well, I should meditate more. I think I put this here as some sort of aspirational thing, but I meditated <laughs> yesterday and it was very helpful. Um, and uh, welcome. It's great to have you here today. Uh, I believe that the world should be a place where everybody gets to follow their hearts and lives their dreams and be in their flow state and uh, offer whatever their gift is to the world to make the world a better place for humanity. So if we can help U.S. immigration laws get out of the way of you uh, following your heart and achieving your potential, then I can die a happy woman. So it's really great to be here with everybody today. Um, and I'm so excited to be joined by my colleague, Corey Faruqi, an amazing business immigration attorney who's worked with me for many years now and uh, has been becoming uh, quite the L1 and H1B uh, expert and is familiar <laughs> with all of our case types. Um, so yeah, and, and Corey, you're child of an immigrant, your mom as well. Um, and I believe this is deeply personal to you as well. Uh, so you've been working in immigration for several years and, um, yeah, no, yeah. I, I love immigration. I feel like I get to use some of the empathy and compassion skills I learned from like getting a psych degree and apply it to immigration practice as well. And being, um, you know, sensitive to clients needs and how important they're their immigration is for them. So it's been a really good experience so far. And I know you have a, a background in humanitarian immigration and mm -hmm. helping people from all sorts of backgrounds. I've done a bit of that work as well. And I remember thinking, and this will, you know, shout out to our student, uh, our, our type A anxious student attendees on this webinar today. Um, I somehow thought that immigration would be easier if I got to work with um, really smart people who always follow the rules all the time. Uh, but uh, we get the opportunity to be compassionate every day because even our clients, especially our clients who have done everything right their whole lives and they have so much potential and they have so much writing on everything, um, all of this is really high stakes for them. And so we try to exercise, we have opportunities to exercise all that compassion we learn from the world of humanitarian immigration law with our business immigration clients every day. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, quick introduction of our team and also just lay of the land. We have an hour. This is live. You will get a recording as Alex mentioned. Um, as you can see, there's a Q&A panel. Somebody who is anonymous has already asked the first question. So that's fabulous. Please note your own settings if you're gonna be submitting a question anonymously or with your name on it. Um, obviously this is not a confidential forum. Um, please feel free to put questions in there throughout in the Q&A panel and we'll answer as many as we can as we go through and also at the end. Um, and yeah, we have a bunch to cover on the journey of a student through immigration, um, CPT, pre-completion OPT, post-completion, regular OPT, STEM OPT, navigating STEM OPT as a founder, bit on O1s, H1Bs I want to touch on, but really put your questions in there so we can be sure to cover everything. Um, our team, Alcorn Immigration Law, is really comprised of amazing, compassionate, brilliant, experienced immigration professionals, attorneys, paralegals, um, and our, our support team. Uh, we help thousands of people from around the world, um, hundreds of cases uh, every single year for companies, for startup founders, uh, personal immigration, EB1A, EB2, NIW, self-sponsorship, all of that. Uh, we have a, a particular um, affinity towards the tech sector, but also biotech and um, also, you know, professional companies outside of technology entertainment, we're happy to help as well. So um, always happy to get in touch and uh, our, you know, our individual one-on-one -on -one process and we'll share more contact details at the end, but you guys are already in touch with our team because you're here today. Um, happy to do one-on-one -on -one consultations. Um, and we have an extensive questionnaire that we would send you first to see what we can do to help you. 
All right. So let's see, Alex, uh, were we able to do a Zoom poll for this slide just to get to know everybody a little bit more? Um, we are curious to know, and, and we imagine, um, oh, there we go. Where are you on your journey? So this is a, a multiple choice poll and you can pick, I think, I don't know if you can pick more than one, but just pick whatever is like most relevant. And, uh, this will help us get to know you. Uh, we have a variety of students at various phases of their education, undergrad, master's, PhDs, even postdocs. Um, so most of those folks are on F1s. Uh, we also may have some Fulbright scholars, which is always interesting. Uh, potentially you're doing HR at a company. So, um, we can include this from your perspective as well. And we have a variety of founders and aspiring founders. So we'll give that poll maybe one more minute. So everybody has a chance. Oh, I think a lot of folks. All right, great. Okay, so we're going to end the poll and uh, we're going to share our results so you can get a snapshot and um, feel free to keep putting those questions in the Q&A panel. Um, but yeah, this is fabulous. So we have many individuals with master's degrees. That is the, the overwhelming majority, but what we'll be sharing will apply to undergrads and PhDs as well. Most of you are on some sort of F1 status. Uh, we have some folks from companies and uh, many people who are already self-described founders or aspiring future founders. So welcome. Uh, this webinar is for you today. Excellent. Okay. So yeah, you can get a glimpse of the results. All right. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Let's close out of this. Excellent. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Uh, that helps us to get to know you and we'll uh, be happy to structure everything for you today. All right. So back in the day, I made this slide of what most students thought they wanted when they were originally coming to the U.S. to study. And I think I first made this slide seven, eight years ago. So a lot has changed. Uh, now we have rankings for which universities are the best for founding startups of all things. Um, but back then we didn't. And back then most people just assumed that the only way to come to the US and to stay was to get a job at a big corporate, uh, a big corporation like Google or Facebook or Apple or even like a Wipro or a Tata and like hope that you could work there on your OPT and then eventually that they would um, sponsor you for a green card and they would do the whole perm and I-140 process. And then, um, but most companies in order to be willing to do that, you would have to get your H-1B selected in the lottery and then you're on your own for citizenship. So that's kind of like the traditional student immigration path. And there's about a million international students in the US at any given time. Um, so I think that's still what the vast majority are kind of looking at if they're planning on staying. Um, but this is not required. This is, this is not mandatory. The immigration uh, is a is a toolkit and you can choose to use the different tools at different times and in different orders, depending on what you qualify for. Um, so by no means are you stuck on this path. It may be useful to you, it may be beneficial, but um, you probably have your sights on something else, especially with your interest in startups. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today, how, um, some people joke that like they're the ones that fell off the assembly line, but we'll be talking about the assembly line <laughs> fell off the original assembly line because it is still possible. Okay, so um, Corey, just to dive into this, we have a lot of F1 students on the webinar today. Can you just give us an overview of, of what is an F1, please? Yeah, F1 visa is available for individuals who want to study in the U.S., um, so you have to be enrolled in an academic program in the U.S. I think the big thing about the F-1 is the single intent visa. So oftentimes people are coming from their home country and attending an interview. They need to be able to demonstrate that single intent to just study 
their program and return back home at the time of interview. And then also demonstrate, right, that they have sufficient funds and a home to return to once completing that. So, um, but it's it's available for individuals who who want to study in the U.S. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, and um, <clears throat> it's been pr it's been relatively easy for people to get F one visas. I feel like coming out of COVID, that's been prioritized. Uh, consulates. So, is what would you say these days? Is getting a new F one visa in your passport uh, a pretty quick visa interview to obtain or is there still some variation i'd imagine there's still some variation um i mean provided you have like appropriate documents and and uh i think you know meeting that that single intent is probably going to be sometimes the toughest part mm -hmm. but <laughs> just making that case for your consular oh, you know what Corey? there is still a range uh, it is quite all over the place some yeah I, I think it is yeah, like, um, gosh, some of the smaller ones have, you know, student visas available in like a day, like Buenos mm -hmm. Aires or like a week, um, like Colombo. But goodness, there's still some consulates with uh, Bonjul has a hundred day wait, Accra has 217 days. Um, so yeah, so if you need a new student visa in your passport, oh my God, Istanbul, 405 days. Oh, they're very popular right now for third country processing. So oh my God. I can see um, wow. there being a lot of variation in, in wait times there, especially yeah. require an interview. Oof. So if you need a new F1 visa, check early, check often, because there's a lot of variation. Mm -hmm. My gosh. Okay. And that's if an interview is required. Okay, so keep that in mind. It's still spotty to travel. Um, okay, so now let's position ourselves in this. Let's pretend we're uh, I'm a I'm a master's student. Um, I'm 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 in a two year STEM master's program. This is my first year. I am taking my finals next week and. Um, I'm going to, I'm studying computer science and I'm from India and uh, my roommates and I have this idea for a startup and we, we really want to try it. Um, but we don't have work authorization right now. We're in the first year of our F1. We don't have um, any like financial hardship issues where we could get a work permit. Um, so let's, let's talk about CPT. Maybe it's eligible, maybe we're eligible for it, maybe it's authorized through university, maybe not, but can you give us a like a basic overview of what curricular practical training is, please? Yeah, CPT is work authorization that can be given during the course of your study. So the CPT, the work that you're going to complete needs to be related to your major area of study. So maybe your idea needs to be related to what you are studying, um, but also, the with CPT, you need to be mindful of how much of it you are to use, because if you do exceed 12 months of full-time work, then it, it can impact your eligibility for OPT, so something to be mindful of. Uh, some individuals do use CPT to start obtaining employment early and connecting with employers, I think, to allow for maybe more time to be put into the lottery or additional chances of going into the lottery, additional years. Um, but it does require that you have an employer. So it wouldn't be available for self-employment. So I think in that scenario you're giving may not work. Um, yeah, this is like a whole thing. This I would say there is a quiet revolution happening right now in the legal underpinnings of uh, the employer-employee relationship in immigration law. And yeah. um there is a shift in the world of H-1Bs where the government is now looking at modern corporate law to determine an employer-employee relationship um, as opposed to common law, which had a very strict overbearing um, rule for what was considered like valid employment. So we see those first shifts happening in the world of H-1Bs where it's going to be easier for um people who are on H-1B to be the CEO of their startup. 
And we can make legal arguments for why this should have a ripple effect. And it's the same legal principles that should now apply for CPT, STEM OPT, TN visas, E3s, H1B1s, all these other visas mm -hmm. that have been very strict about employment. But I would say most universities are probably pretty strict on CPT right now that you need you need an employee, you need another person besides you who's going to train you and who you're going to work for. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. So can maybe work if you're going to be the CTO of your startup, or if you really want to push it, we could attempt for you to do it as a CEO, but you know, that mm -hmm. can be a harder negotiation with your university. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to note, right. The university needs to agree to um, yes. what you're trying to accomplish yes. in order to issue that I-20 that you do need. Yeah, because the way the whole F1 work permission program is structured, the universities are responsible for complying and they report to ICE and CVIS. And um, the universities are very incentivized to be cautious and prudent and go slow and not rock the boat because they're concerned, understandably, that if they got in trouble for making, for overstepping or overreaching with one student startup founder, that it could ripple out and jeopardize their other students and their program. So it can be frustrating for students to work with their universities to try to get more details on this or negotiate, but you just have to understand where they're coming from as well. Um, but CPT is very much university specific and departmental specific. And whether you're program even offers it is an open question. Not every university is willing to authorize it, even to work in a normal job, much less a startup. So it's worth investigating um, before you make any plans. Yeah. And I just want to clarify the caution at the bottom there is one year of full time CPT would eliminate your eligibility for OPT just to make Perfect. it. That clear. is really, really critical distinction. Um, yeah. And I think that most people get like, summertime CPT or part-time yeah. CPT, mm -hmm. but you want to keep that in mind. And, and also you may need to enroll in credits for the CPT and then you're paying tuition to work. And then it might not, it might not make financial sense either. Um, but it is available. Uh, <laughs> also simply like switch students to O1s while they're still enrolled in school um, and they can still study and, and graduate um, as well and like avoid this whole thing. On the other, other hand, I've heard from certain top universities that some of their departments like computer science department at a local top university apparently, and I have not yet been able to reach a faculty member directly to confirm this, but um, Apparently, some universities are concerned that too many students are switching to O1s, and so they want you to be on F1 to be enrolled, even if the university doesn't have that requirement. So that's something that I'm oh, in the midst of investigating. But in general, you should be able to still go to school if we get you an O1 and if we set it up right. So yeah, <laughs> how interesting. It's all university specific and weird, but um, but yeah, so you just want to want to make sure this is all going to show up on your I-20. It's going to be in CVIS. The school is going to need details on where you're working and how much you're going to get paid. Um, Corey, can you have more than one CPT job at the same time? Yes, you can. Great. All right. Wonderful. Okay. So that's CPT in a nutshell. Um, Oh, and here's a here's a CPT question we have in the in the chat window. Answer this live. What do you think of day one CPT master's programs? Thank you for that question. Um, I can share my two cents, and Corey, you know, would love to hear your thoughts as well. Uh, so I've been doing this a long time, right? Like my dad was an immigration lawyer. I started working for him like in the nineties with fax machines when I was a kid. Um, so one of the things I've seen was the creation of this whole like ICE CVIS student system, and then also the Trump crackdown on it. And so what the Trump administration did was they thought they were worried that there were sham schools with fraudulent students uh, pretending to be enrolled to only to seek work authorization. So they set up 
is it dragnet? Is that the word for this? Like they set up a fake school, a fake university that specifically did not meet the requirements. And they got all of these students to apply and get into the program. And then it was like a gotcha. And they're like, ha it was a fake school and it didn't meet the real requirements. And now all of your I-20s have been deactivated and you all have to leave the United States. And so it was awful for a bunch of students. And I, I met some of the people who got caught up in that and it was really hard for them. So um, my thoughts on day one CPT is that there are a variety of completely valid functional programs that you are allowed to use legally for this, but the burden is really on you as the student to make sure you are fully complying and that your program is fully complying. Because if they're not, you can't just be like, oh, well, I enrolled and I thought they were doing it correctly. Like you're on the hook for making sure every requirement is met. So please make sure that that is the situation. Um, Because we can see you know, like, like the Trump administration also had requests for evidence in H-1Bs on if you had been maintaining status through a day one CPT master's program. And we don't know what the presidential election is going to hold next year. And so I think it's really important for people to just hyper uh, commit to compliance right now, especially. Um, Corey, other thoughts on that? Any? Um, I mean, just like along those lines, right? If you do a um a master's pro, the day one CBT master's program, it could lead to more scrutiny, right? With USCIS, um, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't be successful in like in a future application, but like it it can lead to more scrutiny and kind of like a red flag on your case to some degree. So, um, for sure. But- you can still be successful, but <laughs> just mm-hmm. throwing that out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, use it your own caution. Use it your own risk can be valuable. But many. Oh, on that note, though, many students use it if they had a job for STEM OPT. Their employer never got their H one B selected in the lottery. We have other ways to continue to work beyond STEM OPT for a company. Like you don't have to do a day one CPT program. You could do a cap exempt uh, concurrent mm-hmm. H1B program, like through Open Avenues Foundation through their Global Talent Fellowship. So we get that for a lot of people. Um, so things things to keep in mind. Okay, so we've talked about CPT. So bottom line is, um, it is probably hard to use for your own startup, especially if you want to be the CEO. But if you want to explore it, check with your university and your department about whether it's offered, Uh, be willing to pay whatever tuition is required for the credits. Um, Don't exceed 12 months of full-time work. Uh, And the other limbo thing is like, because for example, like um, MBA students, like they get CPT to build a startup for their summer in between the two years and somehow gets approved. Um, But then like they have this Delaware C Corporation and they were just on payroll, but then they go off payroll and then they are still enrolled in fall classes for year two. But then this company is still like existing in the US and they're on the um, like the board of directors and like like I would be concerned if it's still on their LinkedIn profile that they're holding out that they're the CEO because that could be a job and they could they might not be authorized for employment anymore. Um, so you just want to think it through, especially if you're going to use it for a summer. But then, like, are you really stopping your company business activities after that in the fall? Um, be cautious. Yes. All right. Okay. So then, what is? Oh, oops. We have a typo on our slide. Well, it's kind of practice. See. It's built in. Um, Optional practical training, OPT. Uh, (laughs) What is, you know, launch iterate practice makes perfect. Uh, Okay, OPT, what is it? And what's pre-completion and what's post-completion? Pre-completion allows you to work before your degree is complete. So you can work full-time with pre Completion, that's a mouthful, pre-completion OPT uh, while school is not in session and part-time while it is. And then post-completion OPT is 
typically used once you have completed your degree and now you're going out and looking for a job. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, you don't have to like get enroll in um, academic credits to get this. It can also, you can have part-time pre-completion OPT as well. Um, and this is the whole like one year of, of regular post-completion OPT and then the STEM extension. Um, I would say this is more founder, found, founder friendly than CPT but mm -hmm. mostly it's that regular OPT first year where we see the most um, startup founders uh, working in there. And you literally, unlike CPT, where you just get a 920 with regular OPT and STEM OPT, you get um, EAD work permit cards that are like physical plastic cards that come in the mail. And so you have that card, you can show it when you're applying for a job, but then it's your duty to make sure that your employer stays updated in the CVIS system. And um, when you are setting everything up for OPT, um, I did recently see a couple of scenarios. In one scenario, a startup founder put that they were self-employed for their regular OPT. And so then when they were applying for their STEM OPT extension, they had gotten like a job offer from their startup that was more established at that time. So they could say that they were now gonna be working for this company. That was one scenario. We also saw another scenario in comparison where the student put that they were the CEO of their company for their regular OPT. And then when it came time to apply for their STEM OPT and they were saying that they were getting a job offer from their company with an academic advisor for their company, the, the company, the, the university questioned it and they're like, hey, you were just the CEO, now you're demoting yourself to like a worker? Like how should we trust that you have the requisite employer-employee relationship? Now, fortunately, this was a well-established company with lots of employees and there was a, a more wizened um, senior engineer on staff who literally was doing the training and we were able to use the new H-1B laws to argue that it was a sufficient employer-employee relationship. Um, so just keep it in mind, like you are responsible for updating your CVIS entries and make sure, making sure they're accurate. And you also really want to make sure that you don't accrue um, too much unemployment as well. So there's limits on that. But um, let's also, I've been touching on this. What is, what is STEM OPT, Corey? STEM OPT is, you know, additional two years of work authorization post degree being completed um, that's available to people in a STEM field. So there's a long list of STEM designated degrees that are eligible for this two year work permit. Um, I know we got a couple of questions too about yeah, that. We have several questions. Um... Okay, so one question that we got on STEM OPT is, can you have more than one full-time job on STEM OPT? And do, do the new employers need to be informed? Well, first of all, you can have more, you can have more than one job, but each will need a training plan and each will be need to be in CVIS and with the I-20, it's the university's discretion whether they would authorize you to have more than one full-time job. It sounds unreasonable to me. I don't think a university would allow their student to have two 40 hour a week jobs and work 80 hours a week. That's I mean, insane. but I guess they theoretically could. Yeah. Maybe two part-time jobs, but yeah, I would say two. Um, I think like the feedback that we see from universities, they, like you were mentioning, they are a bit more conservative in general. Um, so I think that would be challenging. Yeah. And then whether the new employer would need to be informed. I don't think the government, the university or you would have any requirement to inform them. Um, I don't, yeah, I, I don't see not in your CVIS entries. So I mean, you may want to do it for other reasons, but I don't think that they're going to be told without your permission or knowing. Um, things to think about there would be 
uh, depending on what state you work in and the terms of the employment agreement, they might have some sort of like no moonlighting clause. You can't do that in California, but um, most technology companies have very strict intellectual property agreements that you're signing like CIIAs or PIIAs when you, when you um, become employed. And so you want to be really cautious because they might have claim to whatever you're creating. So um, here's another question. I don't know this one. Somebody is an all but dissertation. So they're enrolled in a PhD program as a student and they want to know if they can avail themselves of OPT. You may be eligible for pre-completion OPT, maybe part-time. It, it could be worth asking your university about it. Um, mm -hmm. Say to look at that. Uh, okay, we have a lot of more STEM OPT questions. Um, for the STEM extension, is there a minimum hours per week required to be employed by a startup if you have another full-time job? I think each job is supposed to be 20 hours a week because that's like the minimum for STEM OPT. Mm -hmm. um, but you could ask your university if they have a different perspective on that. But I could see you having two 20-hour a week jobs or a 30 hour a week job and a 20 hour a week job, maybe a 40 hour a week job plus a 20 hour a week job. But if you're going to do like the full-time day job plus the 20 hour a week startup, and if your day job is at a big tech company, yeah, I would be very cautious because they could own, like, you don't want to, um, you know, be in due diligence for like your acquisition for $200 million for your startup or 400 or whatever, a billion. And all of a sudden your day job is like, Hey, we own that. Cause you were on STEM OPT working full time and you accidentally used your work computer one night. Um, like you want to be very, very careful. Uh, can someone on OPT or STEM OPT work above 40 hours per week? I think yes, theoretically, but university discretion. Um, all right, we're going to keep, I love all the questions. We're going to keep moving forward and we're going to try to get all these answered for everybody within our webinar timing, but we do have a lot more to cover. Okay, so now let's talk about what is work because that is really important as well. Oops. Um, okay, so... The fundamental presumption is that you are not allowed to work on F1 unless you specifically have work authorization, such as CPT, pre-completion OPT, post-completion regular OPT, or post-completion STEM OPT. So all universities interpret this differently. Immigration lawyers interpret this differently. <laughs> there are... There's stuff you could do for classes that's research. There's stuff that you could do for volunteering. There's unpaid internships, but all of these have their own domains. Like an employer could get in trouble for not paying you for an internship, for example. So like there can be a lot of like, you know, caught between a rock and a hard place situations with this stuff. But in general, what are some of the things that are not considered work, Corey, that students can do that are on this slide? Uh, I mean, you covered internships there, founder initiatives. So it was like a really common question that we get is what steps can you take without work authorization um, to start your business? So planning the business or business plan development, um, networking, registering your company, all those passive activities are permissible without work authorization and then volunteering. But this is like true volunteer work <laughs> yeah. it's volunteer for this work it's normal not to be paid for that type of work so this has to be like really um I guess so think of like serving soup in a soup kitchen to the homeless yeah. like that would be okay um yeah. <laughs> doing exactly. an unpaid internship where the company could get sued for violating employment laws by not hiring you don't do that so yeah yeah Exactly. And it's tricky. And then universities are slow to react. Like there's some initiatives that people started thinking about in the Trump administration to be more cautious where they're like, oh, well, can we allow our students to, to do testing on pricing and they're like in our startup classes at our business school. And now, like three years into the Biden administration, they're like, oh, no, we shouldn't do that anymore in our coursework. Um, but like nobody in the administration 
cares. So it's like, wait, you were, if you were going to do that, you should have done that four years ago. So there's kind of a delay, like universities are slow to respond. Um, you can also, you know, and then I would say registering your company, that's sort of in the realm of like, you can negotiate personal contracts or you can, you can negotiate um, the creation of new businesses in your personal capacity. That is all allowed. Um, but you really want to be careful about getting paid, making money when there's an entity that owns the, the um, like an asset, which is related to what you're creating, if you have equity in it. And certainly whatever you put on LinkedIn, like the government clearly holds that like the CEO is a job. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not just a title. So you want to be careful about that. So to that, um, to that end, what are some things that are definitely not allowed, Corey? Um, I think important ones here are the freelance work and influencer work um, <laughs> in the days of social media and Ubers and things of that nature, like these side hustles um, are technically work, you're getting paid. Um, and then we have... Um, certain contracts. I don't know, so if you maybe can highlight on that one a bit more, but. Um, yeah. Well, like if you're buying real estate, yeah, that's a contract, but nobody cares if you own a house because um, it's not work. But if you're uh, signing an employment offer <laughs> to work at a company or you're signing a consulting agreement, that is work. That is unauthorized unless you specifically have uh, the authorization to be able to do it. So you want to be very careful. Anytime there's money or value being created based on your efforts, you want to be very, very careful. All right. So uh, let's talk about how you can take action and how you can kind of take your immigration situation into your own hands. So one route is the H-1B. The lottery is coming up. Uh, we'll be talking about that timeline, but what is an H-1B, Corey? Um, H-1B is one of the U.S.'s work visas that allows you to obtain employment authorization um, for up to three years at a time for a total of six years. There's other sub rules involved there. Um, but first, if you're going with the H-1B cap route, you need to first be selected in the lottery. So um, well, I think we're going to touch a little bit on yeah. that. Um, I have a strange knock on my door, so why don't you tell everybody about the lottery and I'll be right back. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. The important registration dates for the lottery here is early March when USCIS does open the portal to allow employers to register individuals um, for the lottery. Um, and then early to mid-March, the registration period for players to submit to all of those um, beneficiaries begins and then in late March, early April, the selections will happen. And then there's a 90 day period for filing the H-1B petition. And that deadline then lands on June 30th. So there's just kind of like the timeline, important dates to have in mind if you are looking to enter the H-1B lottery this year. So I would say the really important things to add and thank you for that. And fortunately everything's okay, but um, the, the critical new development is if you're, if you want to be the CEO or you want to have more than 50% of the equity of your company now, you no longer have to dilute your equity or get a three person board to be able to fire you. So if you incorporate your startup now and, you know, whether you can work there or not right now is like a separate question. But if you want to be a founder and if you want your startup to put you in this uh, March's lottery um, and you want to be the CEO or the CTO, if you want to have more than 50% equity, like this is the first year where that's legitimately okay. And you don't have to like give away your company and some weird deal to comply with immigration. So I'm super excited about that. Um, now the order of operations of when do you incorporate and who's on your 
who's in your co-founder team and what job are you going to have and how are you going to pay yourself the H-1B wage and where's the money going to come from and how, if you don't have work authorization, are we going to show that you're not working there now while we wait for the lottery? Like those are all things we can consult with you on and figure out a strategy when you become our client. But um, I'm just really excited because of all of these H-1B crackdowns from abuse over the last year, uh, fewer people are going to apply this year and more students are going to have more shots in the lottery because they're going to make it so that each person only gets one chance at being selected. So it's better for small businesses, including startups, and they overtly changed the owner beneficiary H-1B guidance um, to allow founders to qualify for H-1Bs. So that's been a really, really amazing development. Um, let's also talk about green cards. Um, we talked a little bit, I think, I think we're going to first focus on the O one for a minute. Um, and then we'll talk about green cards as well. So many of our clients who are students and founders are like, okay, great. Well, regular OPT works for me, STEM OPT, I don't want to deal with. So how do I get an O one either before I graduate or before the end of my regular OPT and they simply just like relinquish STEM OPT. They're like, screw it, I'm from India. I wanna start my green card soon anyway. I wanna get an O1 to help me get an EB1 later. Um, so really, so the O1 is, is great. Uh, there's no lottery, doesn't matter what country you're from, you can get it any time of year. Basically, because I wanna get to some of the questions. So I'm just gonna go through this in a nutshell with the visa, with the O1 and then the green cards. So um, there's eight categories. Minimum, you need three to qualify. Uh, typically, we encourage our clients to have four or five, but if they're very strong, three would be sufficient. It usually takes us three months to prepare and file an O1 petition. And if you're in the US, you can request premium processing and the government will make a decision in 15 days. Um, you want to double check with your university and your department that you will be able to continue being enrolled in school. Uh, if your O1 is approved, 99.9% .9 of universities should say yes to that, but double check um, if you want to actually graduate. Mm -hmm. uh, a very common fact pattern for pre-revenue, pre-investment startups to qualify uh, would be based on the founder's personal past experience in entrepreneurship or research in the field or any other media that you can get about traction with any early users. Um, competitions that can work include uh, hackathons, pitch competitions, um, the thing at uh, TechCrunch Disrupt, for example, Startup Battlefield, uh, different sorts of investor funding can qualify as an award country level startup grants, non-dilutive funding, those can qualify as grants. Um, so we can use that for awards in terms of memberships, uh, getting into like YC or Techstars or 500 or one of those other accelerator programs can be awesome. If you have an academic background, being in a scientific committee uh, can work in, a, in like a, a membership organization at the professional level. Um, being an advisor to startups can help as well. Um, sometimes you can get publicity as a student, maybe just for creating a, a platform with users, even if you're pre-revenue, uh, if you get enough traction, people might wanna cover you. So if you're in the US, like the tech media, like um, uh, TechCrunch or Forbes or Entrepreneur, um, you might be able to, Business Insider, you might be able to get articles about you there or simply getting um, articles about your, your project in the newspaper of your home country. Uh, you can be a judge at competitions all day long. There's so many pitch competitions, hackathon professional competitions to judge. Um, even if you have a patent pending, that can be valuable for an O1. It doesn't have to be granted yet. Sometimes you can't get patents on software. So if we can just prove that it's original, that can help as well. Um, writing articles, super easy as a student. If you can get into one of the Forbes business or technology councils, they'll let you publish once a month. I can help get like founder, how I built this story is published in TechCrunch. If you want to reach out to us, um, being a leader at your startup is great. Um, if you do get funding or if there's some sort of valuation on your company, 
we can also argue that your equity is worth something. So that's kind of like the broad fact pattern for founder O1s. Um, but remember, this is eight categories. You only need three of them. So once you have that, it makes the EB1A green card much faster of a stepping stone. And um, you really want to position yourself for an EB1A if you were born in India or China. Um, the other way to start getting a priority date now, which is your turn in line for a green card, you can self-petition for an EB2 national interest waiver green card. Um, that used to be our go-to for people from like Europe or Australia or Japan, um, cause they don't have as long waits for green cards, but even that category now is backlogged and there's probably like going to be an additional six to 12 month wait until you can file your adjustment mm -hmm. of status. So you have to be maintaining status the whole time, which is why an O1 is nice. The EB2 NIW is easier than an O1 if you have a solid business plan for like a technology startup that can scale. Um, many of our clients now from India or China are getting EB2 NIWs with a business plan for their startup simply to lock in a priority date. And then later they're gonna use that priority date and pivot to an EB1A and like upgrade um, their petition later. So there's lots and lots of ways to do this. Um, okay, and with that and our remaining approximately 10 minutes, um, <laughs> we'll try to get through some of these 18 questions. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I don't know if we're going to be able to answer all these, everybody, but thank you so much. And if you think of more, you can try to put more in, we'll get to them if we have time. Um, okay. So just taking it from the top, uh, oh, and as we go through from this, I'll also share our contact information here. Um, it, I would encourage you to get in touch for, a confidential conversation um, about what you're trying to build and we're happy to help. And also my book is published and I haven't recorded the audiobook yet, but you can get these in Kindle and um, paperback on Amazon. And so Alex can provide the link. Um, okay, so let's see how many we can get through, Corey. Uh, what's the process for doing a startup on OPT? Do I just need to register a business and report it in the SEVP portal? Um, pretty much. Uh, yeah. You need an I-20 and you get the I-20 by reporting it to the school and then the school, you know, issues you the I-20 and then that's, uh, and you have to make sure you're you're maintaining your SEVIS record. For regular OPT, it's pretty straightforward. It's STEM OPT that has these additional requirements for a training plan and your company being enrolled in E-Verify. Mm -hmm. And then it's um, like CPT, where you want to be really cautious with the school about employer-employee relationship. All right. Uh, is it possible to comply with STEM OPT if my startup's operations are in LATAM, but we are considering doing a Cayman structure? Can I be employed by the U.S. company in that structure? I don't know. We're not corporate lawyers. Sorry. We're immigration lawyers. <laughs> uh, happy to talk to your corporate attorney about this to help solve it for you. STEM OPT requires a U.S. employer. It sounds like your Cayman structure would not involve a U.S. entity, so we would need you to confirm that. We do see uh, Cayman structures using things like deal or remote, like global PEOs, to employ people in the U.S., so that would need to be your employer, potentially, for STEM OPT. Uh, it's very complicated. I don't know. We can do a, a legal advice uh, paid consultation and talk to your, your corporate attorney about that for you. Okay. My OPT expires in Q1 2024. If I don't get picked for the H1B lottery, what are my options? I am an undergrad. Uh, I mean, you have so many options. It depends on what you want to do. I think if you want to be a startup founder, you should be uh, building your portfolio of accomplishments for an O1 now. Um, and we also have a class for that if you want to focus on extraordinary ability and how to build everything up. Um, here's the, uh, let's get the chat window in view. Um, Thank you. Yeah, Alex put the book in there. Here's our online class, Alcorn Academy Extraordinary Ability Prep. So um, promo code journey, 
Uh, I think it's 50% off and um, that will help you start getting qualified. I help lots of students get O1s um, like even before they graduate. So that would be like the most ideal thing probably. Um, just to confirm, is psychology part of STEM OPT? You have to look at the CIP code for psychology mm -hmm. and maybe there's lots of types of psychology. So this is where you want to talk to your, uh, your school about that. And let me see. I think, also... Yeah, definitely talk to the school about it. Cause there are uh, numerous. Like, yeah, it could be, I, if you can still see the answered question, I just put some text in there. There's like a general psychology CIP code. There's research, clinical, behavioral, mm -hmm. cognitive. Yeah. It depends on which CIP code you're getting from your university. <clears throat> um, oh, great. And there's that promo code for everybody journey for 50% off on Alcorn Academy. Okay, next question. Uh, can you clarify if working on a 1099 basis is permissible for F1 students? Um, if you do not have work authorization, it is not permissible. You should not work on a 1099 unless you have a work permit, such as CPT or pre-completion OPT or post-completion OPT or STEM OPT. Can F1 students work for multiple companies during their OPT period, as some sources suggest? Yes. Mm -hmm. How can I ensure ongoing compliance with immigration requirements? Are interim checks available? I don't know. It's your job. You have to figure it out. <laughs> you could hire us to spot check what you're doing, but nobody's ever asked that before. But I guess if there's demand, we could we could build that program for you. Uh, <laughs> what are the key legal considerations and what are some options I have for establishing a design agency in the United States? I would say uh, get an O1 and build it on regular OPT and then get your O1 and then get your EB1A green card. Um, and can I work as a freelancer? And if not, what options do I have to work as a freelancer? I mean, the only student thing where you can work as a freelancer is regular OPT if you studied design in some way. Other than that, you're going to need an O1 or a green card. Okay, a few more. Uh, can I work as a CEO of my startup on pre-completion OPT? Yes. I think you covered that and just running into issues when you switch to STEM, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's the main, that's the main one. That's why a lot of people want O1s instead. Um, and the O1 is a really great marketing exercise. It's really great yeah. for your like go-to-market and thought leadership and influencer marketing and all of that, which can be counterintuitive for an engineer, but um, it's totally possible. Uh, does having a board which can fire you help in establishing the employer-employee relationship? Not anymore for H-1B, potentially for things like STEM OPT, although we're going to try to push it where we can and try to get the legal landscape changed so that it's not necessary anymore. Um, any limitation on applying and working in business incubators or accelerators on CPT, OPT, or STEM OPT? Applying and working it. I'm assuming you're not going to be an employee of the incubator and that you want to build your startup. Um, I mean, a lot of people do incubators when they're students or on visitor visas. I think it's risky, but people do it. Um, I would say it's safest if you're on regular OPT and then you should try to get an O1 as quickly as possible. And if, can you be a founder with a minority stakeholder with the US citizen as a majority holder on the STEM, STEM extension? Yeah, we've seen that. I've also seen people getting, I, I, I have seen now many years of doing this that um, if you go that route, it's very risky depending on your relationship with that person, how much you trust them, what terms you're agreeing to. You know, I've seen people whose ideas should have like a billion dollar valuation where they can't even access their equity anymore because that relationship soured um, the more valuable the startup became. So I would advise you to be very cautious with doing that. 
Uh, basically, the more value you're convinced your startup will have, the more you should invest in yourself and get an O1 to just have the correct amount of equity. Um, we've talked about this, you know, if you, if you know, just try to get an O1 if you can. Um, equity does not count for compensation on STEM OPT. It's all about the cash. Um, what is an ideal volunteer experience for somebody who is looking for work and doesn't want to accrue unemployment time? Uh, oh, I know an organization, uh, that does tech volunteering and they may have, I don't know if they have biology opportunities, but they have, um, oh my gosh, <laughs> I will find it. I will find it. Uh, do you want to answer another question, Corey, while I find this answer for everybody? Yeah, let me look at the next one here. Um, well, I think you covered this one too. Is it possible to apply to H1B as a solo founder in OPT? Um, there's shift right in the guidance that Sophie covered in regards to that. Um, Cool. Okay. So there's this organization called Match for Action and they do volunteer projects in tech and social good. And they're organized around the UN sustainability goals. The reason I found out about it is because I know the founder, Bobby Fishkin, who created it. And um, they actually have a lot of people volunteering I'm confused. They might have rebranded if it, it, it used to be called crowd doing. Um, but anyway, that is the direction to look in. I'm not sure exactly which of these programs it is, but um, there's there's definitely options to volunteer and they may have stuff for biology or maybe at least statistics or something loosely related. Okay, with that, everybody, we are at time. Hopefully we answered many of your important questions and we would love to keep in touch. Um, feel free to reach out to us to schedule an individual consult consultation. If we email you our questionnaire, please fill it out. It's how we figure out how we can help you. We would love <laughs> to help you. Um, but if you don't fill out our questionnaire, we can't. So please do that. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you for joining us and uh, see you soon. Bye.